Hello, everyone. I want to thank your pastor for giving me the opportunity to preach God's word to you today. And uh, there has been a growing anticipation in the last few weeks uh, among many prophets and um, even uh, church leaders in many parts of the world uh, for this Pentecost uh, celebration that we are observing this Sunday, uh, that God is going to bring a fresh fulfillment of it as we pray for an outpouring of His Spirit. And I personally believe that, and that's what I've been praying for as well. So uh, I'm excited to share this word with you. And uh, we don't have time to read the whole book of Acts chapter 2, but I suggest that you do this after hearing this preaching so that it will give you a, a, something to pray for as well uh, as we hear the preaching of the word. So with that, let me go to Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 41. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. There, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received this word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, we just read a portion of Peter's preaching to the crowd that would ga had gathered in Jerusalem and had witnessed this phenomenal miracle, and that was the disciples speaking in foreign languages, even though they were all Galileans. Now, the disciples had been praying for the last 10 days since Jesus went back to heaven and they, were fo they followed Jesus' instruction to wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit. Now, on the day of Pentecost, uh, which was the culmination of the Feast of Weeks, uh, observed over the last 50 days from Passover to celebrate the end of the barley harvest, that's when God poured out His Spirit upon the disciples gathered in the upper room. And then they began to declare the praises of God in the languages of the nations that were there in Jerusalem. And as I said, it was a miraculous sign because these people were provincial Galileans, if you will, not urban uh, Jews. Um, now, the Jews were required to celebrate several annual feasts uh, in, in Jerusalem, and the dispersed Jews were already there in that city after Passover so as not to have to travel again. And that is why, in a sense, the nations were all there when the Holy Spirit came and this is significant, as we will see in a while. Again, the word Pentecost means 50. If you recall, 50 days prior to this, at least in, in our time, we uh, celebrated the Passover during the Passion Week of uh, remembering the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will see this, that in the same way that the death of Christ took place during the Passover feast, uh, pointing to Jesus as the Passover lamb to save those who would believe in him, from the power of sin and death, just as the Israelites were delivered from the angel of death in Egypt, the outpouring of the Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost was not a coincidence. See, the Feast of Pentecost was not only a celebration of the spring harvest, and we know that, uh, as we read earlier, 3,000 people got saved that day, but also of the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. Although this is not clearly mentioned in Leviticus 23, where the feasts were first mentioned. 
the giving of the law of Moses on Pentecost is really more of a Jewish tradition, which was, uh, came about during the intertestamental period. That's between the Old and the New Testament. But I believe it's still significant since Ezekiel 36, 27 says that the Lord will put His Spirit upon His people and move them to follow His commands. Now, as uh, we will read in Acts 2, when the crowd gathered, you know, wondering what was happening in bewilderment, Peter boldly proclaimed that what they were witnessing was a culmination of all that the Lord had promised concerning His saving work, not only for the Jews, but also for all humanity. And so what I want to share with you are the three significant implications of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, for the believers then and for us today. Number one, significance is Jesus is now exalted as Lord and Christ. We know that Jesus first came as a suffering servant to die for our sins. But see, God did not abandon him to the grave. And this is what Peter was pointing out. Now, after his death and resurrection, God raised Jesus up to life and exalted him to his right hand as Lord and Messiah. Now, what does this mean? It means that as Lord, he is now the rightful ruler of heaven and earth, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. You know, the word kurios, Lord, is actually used for the government leaders uh, in, in, in um, the Roman Empire. So, he is saying he's the king, the true king. He's the true Lord. Now, at the same time, the word Christ or Messiah in uh, the original Hebrew language means that he is the one who will save and deliver everyone who calls upon his name. You know, it is not enough that we say that Jesus died for our sins. We should also believe that he also rose from the dead. For it is the resurrected and exalted Christ who is able to save us. See, the outpouring of the Spirit is the ultimate evidence that Jesus is now exalted. Why? Because we know from John chapter 14, verse 16, that the Holy Spirit will only come when the Father and the Son send Him. So parang pinasa na yung baton, mga kapatid. Diba? The Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Holy Spirit it now empowers us so that we can be sent into the world. So we see the divine order of the Spirit's coming into the earth. So that's the first significance. The second one is this. The gospel is for every nation. Not just every nation church, okay? But all the nations of the world. Acts 2 verse 33 says this. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this what you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You know, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, you know, they're, they're the same author, Dr. Luke. Were given was written primarily for the Gentiles. Um, in contrast to the other Gospels, um, you know, Matthew was written primarily for uh, a Jewish audience. John was written for Greeks and uh, um, and Jews as well. And uh, Mark was primarily for a Roman audience. Luke's intention, of course, the Gospel is for everybody, for Jews and Gentiles. But he had many Gentiles in mind when he wrote this, uh, his Gospel. As I said. The gospel was primarily written to the Gentiles. Luke's intention was to point that the gospel is available for everyone. And the Holy Spirit was a confirmation of that people that have received the gospel by faith. Now, and what was the main evidence again of the outpouring of the Spirit? It was speaking in new languages, which as uh, is indicated, are known languages of the nations in contrast or as distinct, rather, from praying in unknown tongues, which is another evidence of being filled with the Spirit, by the way. And you can find this in Acts 10 and 19. We don't have time to get there uh, today. See, the believers were declaring the praises of God in various languages, meaning that the gospel was now available to all the nations. Uh, let me read verse 5 of chapter 2 and then 8 and 11, to, to 11. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, this is out of NIV, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, 
we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, many scholars believe that the Pentecost was actually a reversal of the curse in Babylon. Uh, if you remember that in Genesis 11, he confused, the Lord confused the languages of men for building a tower in defiance of God. Now, because of the outpouring of the Spirit, people were now praising God in one accord in many languages from the nations of the world. Yes, the nations had been scattered then, but now God was claiming all the nations as His inheritance. What an amazing reversal, isn't it? And the third significant implication of the outpouring of the Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit now is God's gift to all who believe. Acts 2.17, uh, first part says this, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And see, the Holy Spirit is not just for a select few people. In the Old Testament, only a certain, you know, certain people could actually receive the Holy Spirit. And these were the ones set apart for service to God. In fact, it was scary then because the Holy Spirit, if you had grieved Him, if you had sinned, and if you had fallen away from God, the Holy Spirit would leave you. That's what happened with uh, Samson, if you recall. In fact, when, Jesus, uh, when uh, David sinned, one of the things that he said, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me uh, when he had sinned against God. But the wonderful thing is this. When the Holy Spirit comes upon those who will believe him, him, not only will he come, but he will dwell with us forever. And so this is what Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 39 further says. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. Now we see that the promise of the Spirit now is for all the people who had gathered in Jerusalem and at that time, but also for the coming generations whom the Lord our God will call. So what do we learn from this? The God, God's presence in our lives is the evidence of God's saving work as we just read. And the reception of the Holy Spirit is the proof that we have been saved, as Romans 8 verse 9 also says. And so we learn that the Holy Spirit is the evidence of a transformed life, the confirmation that we have been cleansed, because we know that the Holy Spirit will not dwell in an unholy vessel. Do you realize that? The fact that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that means you've been cleansed from all of your sins. You may think, Oh, you're still feeling guilty. But let me tell you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, as far as God's concerned, you've been cleansed from all of your sins. And so God can live with you. And so the sending of the Holy Spirit, as I said, is the, um, the evidence of a cleansed life. Now, the sending of the Spirit is also meant to empower God's people. See, the Holy Spirit empowers God's people for ministry and freely for godly living. And I believe in the, com uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to learn more about this. God gives His people spiritual gifts, which is for the common good, uh, for the work of the ministry, and so that we might be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so, what do we learn again in conclusion uh, from this? That God has sent His Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, you know, from the Father and the, the Son, to be with us forever. God Himself lives inside of us now. And really, the Holy Spirit mean, in us means that God is a personal God. He relates with us individually. What an amazing gift that we have from, from, um, from God. And that is Himself, isn't it? And so, in conclusion, going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, if you have not repented of your sins, now is the time to do so. For today is your day of salvation. Don't wait until tomorrow. But today is the day of salvation. And God will give you the greatest gift. And that is Himself. The gift of Himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now if you're already a follower of Christ and you do have the Holy Spirit. You know what? God wants to fill you again with His Holy Spirit. You know, and that's the admonition that Paul says in his epistle. Be filled with the Spirit. There's a continual 
in feeling that the Lord wants us uh, to have. And somebody said, why do we need to be continuously filled? Well, because uh, we leak. Okay? Uh, no, that's, that's not true. The important thing is because we face continuous challenges in the world that we live in, we need the continual filling of the Holy Spirit so that we might be able to face the challenges of our day. And God, I believe, as I said, as we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday today, we can come to God today and cry out, Lord, pour out your Spirit once again. Because the Holy Spirit brings refreshing to our souls. Remember, Jesus said, if you believe in me, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And he meant this by, and he meant the Holy Spirit by this pronouncement in John chapter 7, I think it is. And so God wants to bring refreshing. He wants to renew our strength. He wants to renew our faith. He wants to uh, remove the fear and the worry and the anxiety. He wants to baptize us, immerse us in himself. And he also wants to empower us once again to be his witnesses in this day of fear and uncertainty. And so as we close, I want to lead you all in a prayer to ask God to do what he did 2,000 years ago. To do what he did, um, you know, in times past. Because I believe this promise, you know, as we read in Acts uh, 2.38, the promise is for you and all all your sons and daughters, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. In, in other words, every, na- every generation of Christians that have lived on the earth, this is an ongoing promise, not just 2,000 years ago, but in this day and age, the 21st century, where we desperately need the Holy Spirit. God will give us the Holy Spirit if we ask Him. Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to, the, to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If we ask God the Father, through the Son, He will give us Himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we are so uh, grateful once again that as You did so 2,000 years ago, Lord, You are well able and are willing and so desirous to give us the Holy Spirit if we ask You. And so even now, corporately, together with one heart and one mind, Lord, do another Pentecost in our city, in our church, in our nation, and throughout the whole world. Lord, baptize your people afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us praise you, Lord, with with languages, Father, that will glorify. Thank you that this gift of languages that you're going to give us is the ability to communicate your gospel, Father, to the people that we are reaching. Thank you. It's not just about foreign languages. It's the language of the culture that we are in, the language of the young people, the language of the community, the language, Lord, wherever you have placed us. And so we ask you now, Father, do again a mighty work, a mighty outpouring, so that we might be refreshed and so that we might boldly proclaim your word in this hour, even with signs and wonders following. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.